What does it mean to know God's presence? Our scripture reading is from Acts chapter 17, verses 22 through 31. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how, how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath in all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals, while God has overlooked, it, the, uh, has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has, been given, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Today's scripture lesson from the 17th chapter of Acts bears witness to what I believe is one of the greatest struggles in human existence, and that is the struggle to know God's presence. The setting for today's scripture is a sermon that Paul is preaching about this struggle of knowing God's presence. And to appreciate Paul's sermon, which was preached at the Oropagus, it's important to note the various context of Paul's sermon, of the people who were there to whom he preached. First was the context of Athens, which was the capital city of Greece, and was typically known as the birthplace of Western civilization and of schools of philosophy. Paul found himself in Athens because where he had been before coming to Athens, where he had preached, was in Thessalonica and Berea, which was in northern Greece. The response to Paul's sermons was so violent and tumultuous that Paul was taken to Athens for his own safety. Well, while he's waiting for his companions, Silas and Timothy, to arrive Paul is distressed as he goes around the city of Athens to see that Athens is full of idols. It's such a stressful time that I invite you to hear what commentator John Gill, how he describes this time for Paul. His soul was troubled and his heart was grieved. He was exasperated and provoked to the last degree. He was at, at a par paroxysm. His heart was hot within him. He had a burning fire in his bones and was weary with forbearing and could not stay. His zeal wanted vent and he gave it. Well, prior to the sermon we hear on the Oropagus today, Paul with burning fire has been to the synagogue and to the marketplace in Athens to preach about the presence of God. His preaching in the synagogue and his market and in the marketplace has caused some of the Athenians to take him to the Oropagus, which was in, in Athens, a, a place of the court and religion and philosophy where they mingled together and stood against each other. And as Paul has been brought to Oropagus, part of the reason he's there is because he is preaching about a foreign god, which was illegal in Athens. Paul is in Athens because of the gospel of Christ. He's also there because in Athens there is the context of religiosity. There was no single guiding work of scripture or a writing such as the Old Testament, New Testament, to guide the Greeks in their knowledge of God. There was no priestly caste designated 
for oversight of worship like there was for Israel. There was animal sacrifice, especially of oxen and goats and sheep at various temples, but much of Greek worship was focused on the individual, not on the group. There were thousands of gods and goddesses whom the people chose to worship on an individual basis. As a result, Greece and, and particularly Athens were famous for the number of individual shrines that were built for these Greek gods and goddesses. Paul, as he preached his sermon, said to the Athenians, I see how extremely, how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the object of your worship. Well, it's in the metropolitan area of Athens that religiosity met philosophy. Athens was noted, noted for being the home of Greek philosophy that emphasized reason above the practices of Greek religion. Two of the Greek schools of philosophy that were singled out earlier in the 17th chapter of Acts were Epicureanism and Stoicism. Epicureanism was based on the belief that reality is made up of atoms, particles of, of substance too small to be seen. But it was these atoms that form the essence of all existence. Epicureans believed that pleasure in moderation was the highest goal of life and that good life was achieved through pleasure and the avoidance of pain. The ultimate pleasure taught by the Epicureans was freedom from anxiety and from mental pain as acknowledgement was given to the reality of atoms and to the reality of, of uh, the possibility of, from, of anxiety, freedom from anxiety and mental pain. So you have the Epicureans who emphasize pleasure. And then you have the Stoics, Stoicism, who taught that the essence of the cosmos is God. And that God is the divine reason who governs the cosmos. The highest good in Stoicism was to align personal virtue with divine reason. This would occur as individuals accepted those things which could not be changed and adjusted their personal attitude toward their circumstances. The ultimate goal of Stoicism was freedom from fears and desires. So you have the religions of, of Greek, of Greece. You have the philosophies emphasizing both pleasure or stoic understanding. And in the midst of all this, we hear Paul talk about the unknown God, a shrine that had been built Paul noted this reality of the unknown God as he spoke about seeing the altar that had been built for the unknown God. This altar was an acknowledgement that there is knowledge about God that's beyond the knowledge of human philosophies and religiosity that builds shrines for gods to live in. In the midst of this, the Greeks said that there was a knowledge beyond what they understood a God beyond their understanding. Which leads us to the context of the known God whom Paul preached about. Paul's sermon at, at, at Areopagus proclaimed that God's presence is known not through our endeavors, but through God's endeavors. It is God who made the world and everything in it, Paul proclaimed. It is God as the Lord of heaven and earth who does not live in shrines made by human hands. It is God who gives all mortals life and breath. It is God who raised Jesus from the dead, who is made known to us. Which brings us to the context of Jesus. 
Paul's sermon proclaims that followers of Jesus believe in God who is known, not unknown, but is known as creator, sustainer, and redeemer. As followers of Jesus, it is our faith that God is known through Jesus. It is our prayer that God will be known through our faith, faith in Jesus, that Gregory of Nazianzus described in the fourth century AD. He began his ministry by being hungry, yet he is the bread of life. Jesus ended his earthly ministry by being thirsty, yet he is the living water. Jesus was weary, yet he is our rest. Jesus paid tribute, yet he is the king. Jesus was accused of having a demon, yet he cast out demons. Jesus wept, yet he wipes out our tears. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver, yet he redeemed the world. Jesus was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, yet he is the good shepherd. Jesus died, yet by his death, he destroyed the power of death. Knowing God, knowing God's presence. It's not so much what we do, but what God has done for us. For God loved and gave his son so that we might know God's presence. For God reaches out to us in the context of our lives and helps us to know the presence of the holy. What's the context of your life? Where are you searching for God? How is God known to you? May God bless us as we live with faith in the God who is made known through Jesus. May God bless you as you know God in the context of your life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, amen. pray. Reach out to us, O God, in the context of our lives so that we might know your presence through Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Friends, may God bless you in the context of your life so that you might know God's presence through Jesus, our Lord. Amen.